was not really uh, discussed so much. And uh, as an expert and one of the founder of uh, general geometry, uh, now it's very nice that uh, Dan Waldron from Imperial College in London is giving the overview talk uh, on uh, generalized geometry. And I guess you will also be happy to receive questions during your talk, or do you prefer to keep them till the end of the talk? As many questions as possible is great. Yeah. Okay, so then, uh, uh, then you can start. Thank you. Thanks, Dieter. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. And um, like everyone, I only wish that we were in Banff. Um, we can pretend. Um, so uh, I'm going to try and give um, a bit of an overview of generalized geometry. And um, Miguel gave an absolutely beautiful talk about um, swamp, about swampland and um, had lots and lots of physics in it. And I feel conscious that I'm not going to have very much physics. I'm going to have lots of geometry. But um, I think it, we just had a nice walk around the swamp and looked at things. And I think what I, the message I want to try and get over to you, it seemed the best way to think about this, was that generalized geometry primarily is a tool. And it's a tool that you might use in, in the swamp man. So originally I was wondering whether it's an ax or a uh, something, but I don't think we want to chop down trees. So maybe, maybe as we walk around generalized geometries as a camera or something or a telescope or something that you can use to look at as you, as you go around. So what I'll try and do is rather than tell you um, lots about the ways you might be able to use generalized geometry, I'll try and just tell you something about what it is. And then um, I will, um, I'll try and mention a few things where maybe um, it might connect uh, with the swamp man. Um, and please interrupt me as much as you can, as much as you like, and in the, in the flavor of this is definitely a workshop. I'm very happy to be interrupted. I will try and answer as best I can. If I can't answer, I will lie like my uh, prime minister and tell you there was no party or there might've been a party, but if there was a party, I didn't realize it was a party or, you know, no, I'll try and be honest. Um, so let me start by just saying is a big picture, what is generalized geometry? So in some minimalistic way, it's just a formalism or a set of tools that's naturally adapted to describing flux backgrounds and supergravity. So it's a set of tools in supergravity, but maybe a little more than that. The, the point is that it, it's a way of geometrizing the bosonic degrees of freedom of supergravity. It's a way of sort of unifying the symmetries that you see. And, and one of the nicest things is that it plays nicely with supersymmetry. So if you've got a problem uh, in, in, if you've got a problem in supergravity that has fluxes, then generalized geometry is often a very good way of thinking about that problem. So in some sense, it's the geometry of supergravity. And I think it's a tool that we can use to explore the landscape and maybe test some of the uh, ideas about um, swamp land. Um, so the outline I'll try and follow is I'll start by just telling you something about its basic structure. So I apologize to the people who already know all this um, and the formalism. And then once we understand the basic structure of, of, of supergravity, what the tools are, of uh, generalized geometry, what the tools are. The question, the mantra then just becomes generalized, generalized. So you take every concept you've ever come across in ordinary geometry, and you just write its generalized analog. So you extend all sorts of conventional geometrical constructions. So we can take Calabi-Yau manifolds and generalize them. We can take Lie groups and generalize them. And a way of thinking about those objects in a more generic way is, they're all examples of what a generalized G-structure. So I'll use that language to try and talk about things. Um, I'll then focus on a couple of examples. One of them is looking at uh, four-dimensional flux backgrounds. And within that, I'll focus on how generalized geometry helps thinking about moduli problems. And then as a second example, I'll talk about consistent truncations, which is a case where you have a restricted theory where any solution of the restricted theory is also a theory of also a solution of the full theory. And there we can see that we can actually start enumerating things and seeing which things you can get from string theory or sets or general or from supergravity in which you can't. And then I'll finish by saying a little bit about how generalized geometry can be used to go a little bit beyond supergravity. And as I said, please interrupt me at any point and I will try and stop and ask for questions. Um, so 
Let me thank my collaborators. This is like the, I won't be like the Oscars and read all the names. Um, but in particular, I just wanted to mention uh, at the end of the list there, Ed Tasker, who was my PhD student and very sadly died a couple of years ago. And had, the papers that he was involved in have just come out. So I just wanted to mention him. That's a picture of Ed. Uh, he is there doing a stand-up talk, uh, stand-up comedian uh, session about string theory. I don't know how he managed to do that, but he did. Um, so, so let me start a little bit with what generalized geometry is, and we'll take the example of type two supergravity. So just as the simplest example you might imagine, um, the type two sector of supergravity, as you know, has in it a metric degree of freedom, a B field degree of freedom, and a dilaton. And for simplicity, let's just imagine we compactify. So our 10 dimensional space is some non compact part, and we'll just focus on the degrees of freedom on some internal d dimensional space. And I should say these ideas of actually rewriting supergravity this way go all the way back to uh, Siegel in 93 and then sort of got reinitiated re again by Hitchin and Galtieri's work in the beginning of the 2000s. So the idea is to combine the two symmetries of the theory. So in the supergravity, we have diffeomorphisms and infinitesimally, um, we can think of those as being parameterized by some vector. And we have gauge transformations of two form, which are parameterized by some one form. So if I write the set of symmetries, I can transform the metric by a diffeomorphism, the two form by a diffeomorphism and a gauge transformation and the dilaton by a diffeomorphism. And, the, and if you work out the algebra of those, uh, of those transformations, the diffeomorphisms close into themselves and the gauge transformations couple gauge transformations and diffeomorphisms. And the basic idea is to combine these two objects together into a single object. So we introduce what's called a generalized vector that has built in it both the vector that's parameterizing the diffeomorphisms and the one form that's parameterizing the gauge transformations. And we think of that as just some object on some larger vector bundle, which is essentially just the sum of the two of the vectors and one forms. So if you like, we now have a generalized vector which has twice as many components. Sometimes we'll just write it as the sum of the two things. This space is T plus T stars called the generalized tangent space. And the whole idea is we're now going to do geometry on this generalized tangent space. The key point is that this generalized tangent space comes with a natural metric on it without putting any additional structure. You could just take the vector, the generalized vector V, and contract the vector part and the one form part together. It gives you a number. And Effectively, you, if you think about it in the index notation, it's like you're contracting with this off diagonal matrix. And this off diagonal matrix is just a metric which has signature plus D minus D. So this, this, uh, this metric here, this uh, is invariant under the, orth under the split orthogonal group SODD. Now, if you wanted to think of this algebra of the symmetries, as something that took a vector and a, uh, vectors and one forms and gave back vectors and one forms, you have to integrate this relation. So you have to pull the, the exterior derivative off it. Um, and that's not unique, but there's one way you could do it and you can write it in the following way. So if you use the fact that you can write the B derivative using the standard form, using the exterior derivative and the interior product, you could choose to integrate in the following way. So the vectors just become an ordinary Lie bracket between them. And the one form part's given by this. So it's the Lie derivative of the one form prime, but it's not symmetric. It's not anti-symmetric. This isn't just the Lie derivative with respect to psi prime of, the, of lambda. This object is called the generalized Lie derivative or, more general, or sometimes the Dorfman derivative in the mass literature. And the key property is that if you write it this way, it preserves this metric. So we had this ODD metric eta, and by writing uh, our algebra this way, um, we now have a generalized uh, notion of a, of a Lie derivative. It's a, both a combination of an of a ordinary Lie derivative and a one form and a gauge transformation. 
And it has the property that if you take the ordinary derivative of the contraction of two generalized vectors, it just becomes the lead derivative, the generalized lead derivatives of each vector. So that's the usual way we would say that this, this eta in this metric eta is invariant under this, under this generalized lead derivative. So mathematically, what this does is give the uh, generalized tangent space a structure of a, um, a what's called a Courant algebra. And it's like a Lie algebra on a, a, on a bundle, but not quite, because this bracket, this, this, this generalized Lie derivative, is not anti-symmetric. If it was an ordinary Lie derivative, Lv of W would be equal to minus Lw of B, but it's not true in this case. So that, that's what gives it this current algebra structure. Uh, Daniel, could I ask a question? Please. Is, is, is there like, um, uh, in the same way that you have Lie algebra and Lie group, which includes like finite transformations that might not be connected to, to the identity in a continuous way, is there something like that for the current algebra structure? Some finite version, like exponentiated version? Can you, can you exponentiate? Um, so not really, that's so, there, there is work on that, but I, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a, a, a nice, a nice object that lives above the algebroid in the same way there is for a, for a Lie algebroid. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, wasn't there I mean, some papers by Olaf Hohm and Barton Siebach on that, and maybe also others? Yeah, it's, it's, a, there's a somewhat open question. Mm -hmm. um, there is still a nice uh, group that's living behind this, which is just the group of finite diffeomorphisms and finite gauge transformations. So, um, so there's still a, there's still a group there, but by but by wanting to get a bracket actually on the generalized vectors, that's what pushes us into the current algebra picture. Good. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes. So in the case where we do have a Lie algebra structure, there's a corresponding commutative DG algebra structure that we can use and play with. And this comes up very frequently in certain descriptions, I guess, of physics in this way. Do we have something analogous here because we have less structure? Yes. Yeah, so uh, no, but we're going to see that if you look at certain supersymmetric backgrounds, you end up getting Lie algebra again. Sure. And so you do have that structure. So that's, that's one, of the, one of the directions we're going to go. Thank you. Great. Are there more questions? Okay. So the fact that this uh, generalized Lie derivative preserves the this ODD metric means that we can now extend this to consider generalized tensors. So a generalized tensor is just some other representation of SODD in the same way an ordinary tensor is an other representation of GLD. Um, and because the GLD subgroup, the one that acts the described ordinary tensors, is a subgroup of SODD, we can always decompose any representation of SODD into ordinary tensors. So let me give you a couple of examples. So there's the adjoint representation, um, and that decomposes into uh, a, a mixed tensor here, one index up, one down. That's just like a GLD transformation. By vectors, two indices up and two forms, two indices down. So you can see there's a slot here for the B field that's sort of sitting there if you want. You can also look at spinners of SODD, and they essentially come as polyforms. So the spin, there are two spinner bundles, and they come as either sums of even forms or sums of odd forms. But if you look in a bit more carefully the way the GLD subgroup embeds, they also come with some determinant factor in front. So something that transforms like uh, the, the, the fourth root of the, uh, of, the, of the determinant of the metric, if you had a metric. Um, and for, the, for simplicity, we're just gonna assume everything's orientable here. So you can define this, this fractional bundle. So if you want to, it'd be nice to have the spinners actually just be polyforms. So one thing you can do is slightly extend the, the, this, this, uh, this, this group, the symmetries, and think of things that are representations both of SODD and just some weight, some R plus, which is just this, this weight of this tensor density. So in particular, if I choose the weight to be a half suitably normalized, then these spinner bundles weighted by a half will just become ordinary, ordinary polyforms, sons of odd or, or, or even forms. And 
the nice thing is that the fact that you have this uh, generalized Lie derivative, which preserves the metric, means that you can hence define the generalized Lie derivative of any of these generalized tensors just by using Leibniz, essentially. So we can extend this generalized Lie derivative onto any of the tensors. So for example, if we acted on one of these uh, polyforms, which uh, have the right weight, then the action is just contraction with the vector on the polyform and wedging with the one form. Uh, sorry, I uh, should not have said that. That's just the ordinary Clifford action. Um, so the, the uh, apologies for that. That should read something like the ordinary Lie derivative plus T lambda, which, uh, sorry, that's not right either. I'm gonna mess it up. No, that's right. So um, if we have uh, the, right. So um, that's the setup. That's the way the symmetries work. So we have a set of, uh, we've put the symmetries into a larger bundle and we have this generalized Lie derivative that captures both the diffeomorphisms and the gauge transformations. So the next step you wanna do is to do something which is the analog of Riemannian geometry. So let's do generalized Riemannian geometry. So in ordinary geometry, you would choose some metric, which is general would be invariant under the orthogonal group. If I fix a metric, I fix an orthogonal subgroup of the, of the general linear group. And note the orthogonal group is the maximal compact subgroup of this group. So let's just do the same thing. Let's choose a generalized metric, which is gonna be invariant under the maximally compact subgroup of this uh, structure group that we have. And that's just gonna be SOD times SOD. So we can think of that as living again as something which can contract two generalized vectors. So it's a sort of symmetric, uh, it lives in the symmetric product of the cota of the of the duals of the generalized tangent space. And if you write it out, it just has this usual form that you'll be very familiar from thinking about T-duality. But we're not doing T-duality, we're just choosing to rearrange the fields in this way. So the metric here is built out of, the, the generalized metric is built out of an ordinary metric and a two form. And if we really want to fix the R plus direction as well, how this embeds in the R plus, we also naturally get a volume form, which is just, we choose to parameterize this the dilaton times the, the uh, volume form from the metric. So we see that this generalized metric naturally encodes all the three fields of the never schwartz never schwartz sector of type two. So we've unified the symmetries in some sense and we've unified the, the metric. So now if we really want to do Riemannian geometry, we want to go on and calculate, have the analog of the Levitsky-Vita connection and start calculating curvatures. So, um, to do that, we need to have a notion of a connection. And you just use the stand, you just take what you normally would. So you now have a connection, but now all the indices are running over 2D components. So I can take the derivative along both vectors and one forms of an object that's both a vector and a one form. So we have to say what we mean when we take the derivative. Well, the derivatives in the, in, in the dual of the generalized tangent space. So it's built out of, again, the dual is, isomorphic to itself, so because it's got a metric on it. So if you like, the first component is one forms and the second component is vectors. So we just let the derivative act only in the, in the one form directions. And then you have some uh, analogs of the Christoffel symbols. And then it's very natural to require that this metric also preserves the, o this connection also preserves the ODD metric. So we said that that is equal to zero. And then if we want the analog of levi civita we need to say that this also is compatible with the generalized metric, this new object we put on that encoded the never schwartz fields. So we want the derivative of the generalized metric and also that corresponding volume form to that. So that was these two things that encode the G and B and the, and the dilaton. And then the other condition you need for levi civita is that it's torsion free. Now that's an interesting question, whether you can define torsion in this picture, and you can. So there's a, there's a, I won't go through the details, but you can define the definite, you can define the torsion for a connection. And you find that it lives in certain representations. So it actually lives in, 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 in sort of three forms of the generalized tangent space plus the generalized tangent space itself. So then you can require also that the torsion vanishes. 
So that should define the analog of the levi chibita connection, com metric compatible and torsion free. And, and, and let me just stress this, this connection here is not just a conventional connection valued in SOD times SOD, precisely because if you contract it with a generalized vector, you can take derivatives both along a vector as you would normally, but also along lambda. So this is a different object. And here's the beautiful thing. Once you've got that levi civita connection, you can construct the analog of a Ricci tensor. Again, there's some steps, so I, won't tell you, I won't go through the details, but you can construct the analog of a Ricci tensor from some commutators and of a Ricci scalar. And those two things exactly encode the supergravity. So you can write the action of the supergravity just as an Einstein action, volume together with Ricci scalar for this generalized object. And similarly, the equations of motion just become that the generalized object is Ricci flat. So we found a way of repackaging the uh, supergravity in a way so that it just looks like an Einstein theory, but now with a structure group, which instead of the tensors and so on, instead of being GLD, and now this SODD. And so what's going on is that we're sort of writing things with the structure group that's SODD and the local symmetry, which has a, as a subgroup, the GLD group of ordinary geometry. And the local symmetry now is the, is the maximally compact one. We actually can do local transformations in both SOD uh, factors. And there's a common diagonal factor there, which is the ordinary SOD, which would be the ordinary Lorentz, um, the ordinary rotational symmetry of gravity. So we sort of have a double, if we did this in Lorentz signature, we'd have a double Lorentz symmetry here. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, yes, Dan, I, I have a question. So yeah, yeah. Um, if I remember right, this Ricci curvature depends on the choice of the levi civita con uh, generalized connection. So you need to fix, uh, partially fix the choice. Uh, did you mention here some gauge fixing of the connection? Brilliant, thank you, and Sensei. So what's, what's interesting is that, yes, yeah, so let me say a little more, I was gonna say this later, but I'll say it now. So this connection requiring this to be levi civita metric compatible torsion free, Unlike the ordinary Levy, for ordinary Levy Chibita connection, that completely fixes the connection. In this case, it doesn't. It doesn't completely determine these Christoffel symbols. So you have a family of connections which satisfy this, these conditions. As you said, Vincent, the, the, the analog of the Riemann tensor that you construct depends on which, uh, which uh, element in that family you choose. However, when you calculate the corresponding Ricci tensor, they're all the same, whichever one you chose. So you don't have to fix any gauge in order to calculate the Ricci, but it's okay. true that for the Riemann, it depends on which, which, which case you Sorry, it, it seems that you need to fix the divergence operator. Perhaps this is implicit in your- Ah, uh, uh, sorry, yes. This <laughs> is the fact, sorry, I understand. This is the fact that I'm choosing uh, the torsion to also have a piece along here by using the R plus, and that's fixing the divergence operator. Yep. Oh, okay, so you so implicitly you are fixing that too. Thank you very yeah, much. I think of it as part of the torsion. I, I did yeah. not uh, understand this point. No, thanks. Are there any other questions? Okay, so that did the Never Schwartz, Never Schwartz sector. So you might naturally ask, um, what about the other part? And you can arrange all the fields of the supergravity, of the type two supergravity, uh, into um, generalized tensors. So for the Ramon Ramon fields, uh, we can think of them as the polyforms. So depending if we're in type 2A or type 2B, they're either odd or even forms. And to do that, we're using what's called the democratic formalism, where you think of introducing uh, all the odd forms or all the even forms and the equations of motion set them to be uh, uh, self-dual. So from that point of view, you can think of the Ramon, Ramon fields and also their potentials as being just uh, generalized spinners. And for the fermions, the fermions become representations of the uh, compact group, and there's two uh, Lorentz groups. So the Gravatini have vector parts that transform under one and spinner parts that transform under the other, 
and the dilatini have just transformed in one or the other. They're spinners of one or the other. Now, I wrote this as though we were doing a compactification, but actually you could do this completely for the full 10-dimensional theory if you want. So you could then take the structure group to be SO1010 and just take um, the compact part, not actually the compact part, but choose two Lorentz factors instead of SOD times SOD. So that would allow you to rewrite the full 10-dimensional theory. Um, now, there's a natural question that we've doubled, the, uh, we've doubled the, the tangent space, and you might wonder whether really what's going on is that you double the space time. And that's the idea of double field theory, which was introduced by uh, Holland Spivak and Hom Holland Spivak, which, which is a very interesting one, and, and starts by thinking about strings moving on tori. So I want to just postpone that for a moment. Um, there's a question how you interpret things if there's a doubled space. But in the, in the simplest form of double field theory, you, you double the space and then actually you constrain it again. So you take a doubled space and then you assume that everything's independent of half the coordinates. So effectively, you'd have some doubled space and then you end up projecting down actually just onto some d-dimensional space. And the equations you get are the same as the equations of generalized geometry. So whether you think of it as double field theory that you then restrict, or you just only double the tangent space, the, the set of equations you get are the same. But there's a, obviously a whole lot of interesting things to say if you can really have some double geometry. We'll try and come back to that a little bit. Okay. Sorry, can I ask? Yeah. If, if we were to double the geometry or, and not live on the slice, would there be any reason to expect that there's still local physics, local interaction, local fields? <laughs> No, so that's a lot of what the a lot of what the question is. So the way double field theory was originally done was to take string field theory and to try and truncate to some subsector, which is a sector which has only winding and momentum modes and no oscillators. And originally, you just calculate the interaction up to cubic order. Um, there are some uh, there's an argument originally due to Sen, I think, that there is some sensible way of integrating out the, um, the, uh, the oscillator modes. Um, but indeed, it gives you some theory which you can think of as sort of truncation of string field theory, which is naturally written as some L infinity algebra and so on. And it's, got a, it's got infinite numbers of terms. So I don't think you should think of it as a local theory. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, so going back to, to, to supergravity, you might immediately ask, well, what about the ramon ramon fields? Could we geometrize them as well? Or more generally, could you think of having some generalized geometry for M theory for 11-dimensional for supergravity? Um, and it turns out you can. And what you have to do is to change the uh, structure groups. So, so let, me, let me try and motivate that for you a little bit. So for the case we just discussed, there was this key element, which was we had this, this ODD metric, which we can think of as a map, for, you know, it takes pairs of generalized vectors and gives you some number. So it sort of maps pairs symmetrically, pairs of generalized vectors to give you on, onto, some, onto some vector space here, which is in this case, just, just, just the real numbers, just the one dimensional vector space. Now you could consider something else where you've got some vector space E and some vector space N, and let's choose them to correspond to certain representations of the exceptional group. So I've written here the exceptional group thinking diagram, and let's take the representations that live here and here. And there is a nice symmetric map from here to here. It takes symmetric products of these and projects onto this bundle. Um, and actually, if you look at this map, if you just think of the vector spaces and you try and um, uh, ask what is, what's the, um, what, what group preserves this map, you actually can see that it's actually none other than this group. So, but put another way, there's a natural way of extending what we just did now from the orthogonal group to an exceptional group, where this is the split form of the exceptional group. So the one that's got us, you know, the um, most number of, uh, the largest difference, the, the, the smallest difference between positive and negative directions in this metric. Um, having done that, 
you can follow through the same kind of construction that we did before. So I'm not gonna give all the details, but a key element here is that you need to pick out a maximal subspace in this, um, in this generalized vector space now, um, such that uh, when, you can, when you take this map, it vanishes. So you take the largest space for which that's true. And it turns out that there's two possibilities that happen. One is that the space, the dimension of the space is just D and the other the dimension of space is D minus one. And in this case, this space is, so in each case, there's a subgroup of the exceptional group that acts on the space. It's just the general linear group. So these two possibilities actually correspond to the two ways that you could do 11 dimensional supergravity compactified on some D dimensional space or type 2b supergravity compactified on some d minus one dimensional space. So in particular, if you take this case, the generalized tangent space then decomposes into vectors, two forms, five forms, and in general, some funny thing which has a one form component and tensor a seven form component. If you did the Type 2b, you get vectors, a pair of two for, of one forms, some three forms, a pair of five forms, and again, some funny 10 set product thing. And just notice that in here, there's a subspace, which is just vectors and one forms, which is the one that we talked about before. That's the ODD one. So in going to this exceptional group, you extend this, this tangent space by a whole lot of extra bits, or equivalently in M-theory, you just get something. And the idea is, as before, these bits just correspond to the symmetries of the theory. So let's take the definiteness, let's think about M theory on a seven dimensional manifold. So let me remind you what the fields are gonna be. There's a metric, there's a three form potential for a four form field strength. And we can introduce a dual six form potential for a seven form field strength. And if you like the dual of that seven form field strength, the 11 dimensional dual of that is just the flux on the four dimensional part of the space. And these potentials have corresponding uh, field strengths. This just comes from the Chern Simons term in M theory. And this bundle, this natural generalized tangent space, now has bits that give diffeomorphisms, that's the vectors, gauge transformations, two form gauge transformations of the three form potential, five form gauge transformations of the dual potential. And then there's this extra piece here, which is sort of wanting to be dual diffeomorphisms. It's sort of the dual of this guy for a dual graviton. You can again construct a generalized the derivative. I won't write it out, but it constructs just in the same way as before. It combines the algebra of these symmetries. And usefully it's independent of this tau bit. So actually this isn't playing any role. The dual, the dual diffeos are not, are not present so long as we're in, um, go in, in, in E7 or lower. So as before, we have a generalized tangent space. We have some generalized lead derivative. Again, this no longer is anti-symmetric. It forms now some Leibniz algebraoid. It's even got a, it's got a different structure from the current algebra, but again, it's not, it's not a Lie algebra. But you can do the same procedure and ask about uh, generalized uh, Riemannian geometry. So again, we just follow our nose as before. So we again look for the maximally compact subgroup. Um, and we find that it now, uh, we take a metric, which is invariant under that. And again, it just encodes the degrees of freedom of the supergravity restricted to our seven, in this case, seven dimensional space. So the maximally compact subgroup here is SU8. And the, the degrees of freedom become metric, three form, six form, and then an extra scalar, which you can interpret as just being a warped factor for the four dimensional external space. So you um, keep going as before, you construct some analog of the Levi Civita connection. It's going to preserve the structure, it's going to preserve. Uh, a, in a general one will preserve this structure as the other one preserved an ODD structure. And you'll get some torsion. And now the torsion lives in a particular representation, which is this, this one, which is next case is the 912 representation. But the beautiful thing is, again, you construct the Levi-Civita that's metric compatible and torsion free. 
as came up before, it's not um, unique, but the corresponding Ricci tensor is independent of which connection you choose. You work out the uh, Einstein action, and it's none other than the um, 11 dimensional supergravity restricted to the seven dimensional space. So again, we've geometrized the fields of the supergravity into some just Einstein theory. As before, the fermions come in representations of the compact group, which is now SU8. And if you did all the same that I described, but now for the other uh, case where the generalized tangent space was gave you type 2b, you get the full bosonic uh, theory of type 2b when you work out the Einstein tensor, which would give you both the never schwartz and the Ramon Lamont fields together. Okay, so. At this point, I've just shown you that there's a way of reformulating the supergravities so that they look like Einstein theories. You don't, you might ask, what if you wanted to do the full 11 dimensional theory? Uh, you can do that. What you want to do is just essentially assume you have a kind of product structure. So you assume that, that locally you can think of it as a four dimensional and a seven dimensional theory, for example. And then you decompose everything into the four dimensional and the seven dimensional part. You're not actually doing a dimensional reduction or anything. You're just choosing to decompose everything that way. And some things will look like scalars from the four dimensional part point of view. And that, those are the things that we've already described, the things that live purely internally. And there will be some other things that are mixed. They're going to look like a set of gauge fields here. And then there'll be things that look like, anyway, you can reformulate the whole thing using generalized tensors. And that was actually first done in these papers on exceptional field theory, which are, again, as in double field theory, you could imagine extending the space time and exceptional field theory that also goes along with the idea of expanding, ex expanding the space time. And effectively, what you're doing here is you're writing the higher dimensional theory as though it was a four dimensional theory and keeping an infinite number of fields that depend on the internal coordinates. And this is an idea that goes back to DeWitt and Nicolai. There are some other very obvious things. You could go to E8. You can do that, but uh, you have to put a bit more structure on, precisely because in that case, these dual diffeomorphisms are appearing. It gets a little bit more fiddly. Um, people have thought about E9. I don't want to go E10, E11. You can think about that if you like. I just point out there's a sort of pattern here that's going on. Um, the groups that are appearing when you go from ordinary geometry to the first ODD generalized geometry to this exceptional, they're just the ADE um, simply laced the algebras. So there's, and we take the split forms of them. So if I take the split form of the A case, that's just special linear transformations. If I add in R plus, that's just like GLD, that's the ordinary gravity. If I do it for the D case, I get the original generalized geometry. And if I do it for the E case, I get this exceptional one. So you might ask, are there other things you can do, other groups you could use? There are, but it's somewhat limited. So you could take SOD D plus N, that sort of gives you the heterotic theory, but there isn't so many other, there are a few other things you can do, but it's, it's fairly limited. So you might wonder if there's something a, it's mysterious, right? We didn't construct these. If, once you've seen this construction, you could just start going through groups and see what you get. And somewhat miraculously, these things give you the supergravity theories. It's sort of, even though you didn't put any supersymmetry in anywhere. Okay, so that's the, that's the general way that uh, the generalized geometry works. And now, um, I wanted to say a little bit about, so that gives you the, the idea. Now I wanted to say a little bit about how it can be a tool and, and what happens when you try and use it in different ways. So um, as I said, rather than try and go through a whole list of ways people have used it, um, I'm gonna just tell you the sort of underlying ideas between the different, hopefully the underlying ideas about the different ways it's been used. And then maybe that's enough flexibility that we can think how it might be used in other problems, which might be relevant for for this workshop. So, as I said, so far, this is really just a kind of reformulation. Um, and um, the, 
but it's given us the idea is it's going to give us a set of new tools and the new tools for thinking about things like supersymmetric flux backgrounds maybe we can explore the landscape beyond what we've already looked at actually brings you a lot of tools for ads cft it gives you ways of thinking about dualities so we'll see maybe it's got suggestions about topological theories you can ask questions about it might be useful for thinking about questions like stability it also actually gives you very natural generalizations of existing geometrical structures. So it sort of has interesting uh, points to interesting directions for mathematics. So here's the mantra that I mentioned at the beginning, which is that you just take any idea you have in conventional geometry and you just extend it to the generalized case. So we've already seen that for the um, Riemannian case, we saw that if we extended Riemannian geometry here, we got these supergravity theories, but you could do it for other things. So you could do it for Calabi-Yau manifolds, G2 manifolds, just complex structures, Lie groups, et cetera, et cetera. So in a sense, what people have been doing or some, some things of what people have been doing is taking these ideas and extending them to, you know, taking each of these conventional things and extending it to something else. So there's, um, there's, a, there's a useful way to think about what these different conventional geometries are and how they might extend. And that, that's the language of G-structures. So I just want to say something about that because it's helpful to understand how we can extend in each of these cases. But before I go there, are there more questions? Okay. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, hey, hi. hi. I have a question. Maybe you already commented on it uh, and I missed it, but um, does this formulation help in understanding an off-shell formulation of type 2 theories, like in particular type 2B theory? I mean, you know, the, the issue with the self dual five form. Yeah, not really, because we sort of... Um, if you want to go to the exceptional one, then you're sort of restricted to only look at six dimensional spaces. So you have to sort of already split it into a four and a six. So you sort of got around that problem already. And if you try and do it in the ODD case, you're already in the, in, in the democratic formalism. So you sort of, you've made it worse. Like you've made everything self pure So I don't think it's helping particularly. Okay. Thanks, Thank Are there any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Hi, Dan. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, maybe it's too trivial, but you know, if you did this for N theory now, I mean, like, can you go through the dualities? I mean, can you do the same for type 2B, just, you know, uh, in the, the way you did it for the for the Neve Schwartz field? But can you write the, the total type 2B action then also as integral R and yes. get the whole uh, RR sector out of it? Yes. The level of supergravity now. So if, if, I, um, if I restrict, in the simplest case, if I just restrict type 2B to say a six dimensional manifold, uh -huh. uh, and I write out this object, but now for the exceptional case, I'll get the full type 2B theory with the Ramon Ramon field. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Any others? Um, Right, so, so to think about how you might extend here, I just wanted to mention this idea of G structures. So, so let me first think about it in the conventional way and then we'll just we'll generalize. So um, this is a useful, it's just a useful kind of way of talking about different geometries you might think about. So what you do is you, you, you go to the frame bundle. So the frame bundle for the tangent space is just the set of all the, a, a section of the frame bundle is just a particular choice of frame. Um, and any two frames, no metric or anything, nothing orthonormal, and any two frames are gonna be related by some GLD transformation. So you can think of the frame bundle as a principal bundle where the fiber is just, just the group. Um, right, so the frame bundle in this case is a principal GLDR bundle. It's got an action of the group bundle. Now you can think about looking for some subgroup of GLD, let's call it GS for structure, um, and ask if there's a principal subbundle. So can I find some subbundle here where the fibers of this thing are not the full GLD group, but um, some subgroup? That's called a GS structure. 
And effectively, what it's saying is that the tangent space is not twisted as you go around the structure group. It's not twisted as you go around the manifold by GLD transformations, but it's twisted by some by some subgroup. So the simplest example, very simple example, you could choose GS to be the, orth the orthogonal group. Then the subspace here is the set of orthogonal frames, orthonormal frames. So picking the subbundle, the set of orthonormal frames, is the same as picking a metric. So you can usually think of G structures in two different ways, either as a subbundle or as something defined by some invariant tensor. In this case, it's the metric. So you can do lots of other examples. So let's suppose we're in even dimensions, it's, if it's even dimensional, you could choose the group to be the general linear group NC. That just defines an almost complex structure. It means that the tangent space decomposes into two parts. The complexification of the tangent space decomposes into two bits, the eigenspaces of the, of the almost complex structure. If it's a symplectic group, it's an almost symplectic structure. It doesn't have to be closed yet. And if it's the SUN group, it's an almost Calabi-Yau structure. So again, this group is determined by a pair of objects that would, for a Calabi-Yau, would become the symplectic form and the holomorphic N form, three form in, in six dimensions. But again, at this point, there's no restriction that things are closed. So this is just a way of keeping track of, of the structure, of some reduction of the structure. And there may be obstructions to finding these things. So for the metric structure, you can always find a metric. So there's no obstruction, but there may be topological obstructions to finding, to finding these other objects. So um, that's a sort of algebraic description of what's going on. And then you can also put some differential conditions on. So you can define what an integrable, this is this tentacle integrable, or, or generally torsion-free structures. And that's like the levi chivita story. So you look at some structure and then you ask, can you find some torsion-free compatible connection? So the, the connection has to preserve whatever objects defining the structure, the derivative of that object has to be zero. And then it also has to have no torsion. So for example, you'd need some connection such that uh, dw was, d omega was zero, that would preserve, sorry, that the, derivative of omega was zero, that would preserve the symplectic structure, and also the torsion of that connection has to be zero. And when you do that, you find that the structure gets restricted. So if you have a torsion-free connection on an almost complex structure, that just means it's now a complex structure. From one point of view, the nine has tensor vanishes, or from another point of view, there's some involutivity conditions. So if I take vectors that live in the sub this subspace, when I take their Lie bracket, they stay in that subspace. For symplectic structures, it tells you the form is closed. For Calabi-Yau structures, it tells you it's honestly Calabi-Yau, both the symplectic structure is closed and the holomorphic N form is closed. So there can be a topological obstruction to having the structure, and then furthermore, there can be an obstruction to whether you can find this connection, and that obstruction is called the intrinsic torsion. So for the case of levi chivita we could always find a connection. So the, the, the intrinsic torsion vanishes in that case. But in these other cases, there's a non-trivial intrinsic torsion, and it corresponds to these differential conditions that we get. Is that set up OK? Do you have questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Hi, Dan. Thanks for the talk. Hi, Eric. Um, so is, this, is there any sense that people studied um, um, the the difference between uh, real and integer cohomology with respect to whether these are closed or not. So whether you can have some forms, what, what does it correspond to when the form is 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 uh, trivial in 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 real cohomology but not in so it's like discrete torsion. Is, is, is there any sense in which discrete elements of these groups and discrete torsion have been studied? So I don't think in this G structure language because it's very local, right? So but the um, I think, I mean, there's definitely things like, you know, uh, um, Kähler-Hodge manifolds, right? Where you know that the symplectic form is actually an uh, integral class and you can think of it as coming from a line bundle, but maybe that's not quite what you meant. Yeah, I mean, they're not, it's not so local in the sense that there's this snail house tensor, right? And I mean, locally, 
right? There's some global aspects of the yeah the, the, of the manifold that's that's being kept, but like the, you know, it's, especially yeah, currently, yeah, like yeah. how many supersymmetry globally defined spinners you have. So it should yeah, be global yeah. in that sense. Maybe I should. Uh, be yeah. So there should be some like for example, you can have Calabi as with a long number group SU two times Z two. So how is that described in in this I, language? I yeah I I don't. Uh... I think what I meant was that the the structures are usually described as things that preserve certain forms, which are local objects. So from that point of view, the Z two would be hard to see. Um, I guess yeah, you, could whole, think it, you could think of it in terms of the, in terms of the reduction of the of the principal bundle. I think that's fine because you could have a Z two factor there. Right, exactly. Uh, it would be harder to write down some invariant tense, you know, char locally characterize that by invariant tenses. That's, that's the only point of it. But the tenses have to be globally well defined, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I just mean what, so either, okay. so in the SU2 yeah. case times Z2, I want to have an SU2 structure, but I wouldn't have it. So I'd just sort of be forced back to the SU3 structure and I wouldn't know how to write a tensor to distinguish. Right, but it's, it's, somewhere, it's somewhere in the middle. It's somewhere, like in terms of supersymmetry, it's also somewhere in the middle, somewhere between n equals two and n equals four. Yeah. So I don't know if any of this has been captured and I've never seen any kind of discrete element discussion no. in this. No, so, so, so no, the simple answer to your question is like, no, I don't know any way of okay. answering that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. There was a party and I went to it and I admit I don't know any way of capturing it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's that's the setup for ordinary G structures. So then you just want to do the same thing in the generalized case. So you can think about generalized G structures, and all we do is we extend. So we now think of a frame bundle for uh, the generalized tangent space, and that's going to be either a principal SODD bundle or EDD bundle. And then you can think of principal sub bundles, which will define some structure. And again, up to Aaron's comments, th th these will be defined by, by, by some invariant tensor or tensors, generalized tensors. And then again, you can think about some integrable things, which are ones that have compatible torsion-free generalized connections. And it turns out that this, this setup is useful for describing things. So in particular, it can be used to describe supersymmetric backgrounds or it can also be used to describe, yeah, it, it characterizes, gives you lots of interesting things for doing um, supergravity, different kinds of supergravity backgrounds. So actually the first example of this was the way that generalized geometry started in the maths literature, which is by Nigel Hitchin and Marco Gautieri, and they actually thought about the analogs of complex structures. So they defined something called a generalized complex structure, which is, again, we're in even dimensions. We have SO, 2n, 2n, and you think about some subgroup that's u, n, n. And it turns out that that can be defined by some invariant tensor that's got mixed indices, one up, one down, as generalized vectors. And again, it effectively just decomposes the generalized tangent space into two bits, the sort of analogs of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. That's the topology. Then the torsion-free condition, again, means that this thing is involutive. So you look at that sub-bundle, just like an ordinary complex structure, you ask it to be involutive. But now, under the um, generalized lead derivative rather than the ordinary lead derivative. And to the question from before, one thing that happens is that when this is involutive, the bracket on L actually becomes uh, uh, anti-symmetric. So actually, this gives on L the structure of a Lie algebroid rather than a Courant algebroid. And in this case, you then get the dual cohomology. And um, if you look at this in more detail, you find that these structures are in some sense interpolating between complex and symplectic structures. So locally, the, what this does is it takes the tangent space and says part of it is complex and part of it is symplectic. You can refine it slightly to think about some SUNN structure. That's usually called a generalized Calabial structure. And now the invariant object is actually one of these spinners, one of these polyforms. And you can choose different cases depending exactly how, um, what dimension you're in. So it could be either an odd or an even form. And the 
fact that it's integrable, that it's torsion free, now just says that this thing's closed. And there's a whole mass literature looking at these generalized complex structures and more refined things called generalized Kähler structures and so on, and trying to understand, um, find examples of them, understand their moduli and so on. So more generally, you can take a generic flux background question and translate it into what a problem in terms of generalized G-structure. So that's the kind of motivation I'm trying to give to you that if you have a given problem, you can often rephrase it in this way. And it's a nice way of parameterizing it if you want to try and work out things like moduli or if you want to understand the supersymmetry somehow. Any more questions? Okay, so let me try and do, be a little bit more specific. So suppose, for example, you were interested in four-dimensional flux backgrounds. And I'll say a sort of baby landscapey question, which probably isn't very well stated, but anyway. Um, suppose you have some problem like, you know, usually the way we think about, uh, originally a long time ago, people thought about lifting moduli was that you turn on, uh, you might have some Calabi-Yau background and you turn on some flux and the flux might lift some of the moduli. Now, it might be that there are also some, uh, it might not quite solve all the equations of motion. So sometimes the argument has to be that actually it lifts them and it's not quite a solution here, but there's somewhere else where it's a solution. And you sort of want to be sure that the moduli that you thought you lifted are actually really lifted. So you might actually want to go to some actual supersymmetric background, which now has some back reaction, some flux turned on, it's no longer collab yeah. And you might want to really know what the moduli are around here. Or alternatively, you might just have some other vacuum that's got nothing to do with the collab yeah and flux. You're just interested in, in what are its supersymmetric, some supersymmetric flux background. You're interested in what are its moduli. So from that point of view, we'd like to have a way of characterizing generic supersymmetric flux background. Uh, we might like to understand what their moduli look like. Now, I, I, just as a reminder, I'll remind you that there are no go theorems, which says you can't have flux backgrounds without some sources. So really secretly we have to have sources in these backgrounds. Okay, so let me give you the classic example. So this goes back to uh, two of our organizers and Ruben Manassian and uh, Alessandro Tomasiello. And if you want to generalize the notion of a Calabi-Yau compactification, including a warp factor and type two backgrounds, you can think of it as being determined by some SU3 times SU3 structure. So that's like a pair of complex structures, generalized complex structures. And it turns out they're defined by one uh, even polyform and one odd polyform. And you get a set of equations which say that the, if we do type 2b, it says that the, the odd one here is closed. So this is a nice integrable structure. But the even one, well, the real part of it is closed. So it looks nice and integral. But the odd part, but the, 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 so the real part, the imaginary part satisfies some other condition which involves the, involves the Ramon Ramon flux. So from the point of view of the language we were using before, we have this structure, but it's got some non-zero intrinsic torsion. And the non-zero intrinsic torsion is being captured by the, by, the, by the Ramon Ramon fields. This operator here is just, you act with the complex structure and D, the commutant of those two. So it's sort of the analog of the conjugate DC in complex geometry. Okay, so after this sort of enter the physics literature, there's been, this formalism has been used in a million different ways. So I list various people, but I'm missing a million people, but um, hopefully several of the people here. And so there's lots of different things you could do, right? You could look for new vacua. You can write down the analog of book of buffer with super potentials. You can write down effective theories using these structures. You can ask how do you characterize supersymmetric brains using calibrations. You could try and go to non susy things. Can you tweak these equations in some way so that the, you get a background that's non supersymmetric? Um, can you look for stability? That's some recent papers, partly by Alessandro, looking at this. Can you, can you understand stability of vacua um, due to tunneling using this language? And there's another whole section here, which I'm ignoring completely, which is the sigma models that describe these backgrounds that can also be written using generalized geometry. So let me just focus on one little bit, which is trying to analyze the generic moduli. 
So let's just suppose we have a solution of these equations. Can we understand what the moduli are around that point? Is there a way of like uh, characterizing them? So um, the natural thing to do is to geometrize further, right? So we'd like to geometrize everything. So that's uh, going to the picture where we put things in the exceptional group. So we'll work actually in the E, in the um, E7 group. So we've now geometrized the Ramon Ramon fields as well. And in that case, our supersymmetry parameter lives in SU8. And if we're fixing one supersymmetry, we have a single vector in SU8. The group that stabilizes that is going to be SU7. So the, the symmetry, the, the, the natural structure group here to think about as an SU7 structure. And it turns out that you can show that the conditions of supersymmetry are exactly equivalent to the existence of a torsion-free SU7 structure. So you can directly reformulate the problem in terms of a generalized G structure. So what are the conditions of torsion-free here? And they naturally form into two parts. There are some F terms and some D terms. And this is just what I was saying that generalized geometry plays nicely with supersymmetry. You know, from a four dimensional point of view, if you're looking at a supersymmetric vacuum, there should be F terms and D terms coming from superpotential or from um, some moment maps. And the equations just naturally arrange themselves that way. So what happens is the generalized tangent space, which is um, 56 dimensional in this case, this structure, decomposes it into four bits. And again, the F term, part of this torsion-free condition, just says that this part of the bundle is convoluted. So if I take two vectors there, I take their generalized derivative, it stays there. And as I said before, in fact, this thing becomes anti-symmetric on this space. So it actually gives you a Lie algebroid on here. And there's another term, which is a D term, which is like a moment map. So you know that in ordinary unequal one super gravity, the vector multiplets, uh, the D terms come from an action of the group acting on the, um, on the chiral multiplet modular and the chiral multiplet space. So what's happening here? Well, geometrically, you can think about some big space, some infinite dimensional space, which is the space of all these SU7 structures. And on that space, there's a natural Kähler metric, which is inherited just from this coset of the, of the groups. And furthermore, there's a moment map on this space for the action of the full set of symmetries. So there's diffeomorphisms plus the gauge transformations. So that's what this moment map is. It's a, it's a moment map on some infinite dimensional space. As I said, Involutivity allows you to have some Lie algebraid structure on this L3, on this, on, uh, sorry, I should have called it E there, on this um, E3. Um, so there's some natural cohomology that comes along. And it turns out you can show that this natural cohomology counts the moduli. And furthermore, this cohomology actually just reduces to a cohomology that's defined by um, one of the um, generalized complex structures. So you remember we had these two generalized complex structures and one of them was integrable. So in fact, everything reduces actually to just something involving just this object, just, so just the geometry determined by that object. So what you get is a cohomology on here, or ordinary generalized complex structure cohomology, which has been considered in the mass literature by Gautieri and Cavalcanti. And you just get that twisted maybe by some Ramon Ramon plus. So you get some sort of twisted cohomology here that you can use to count the number of moduli. And what you find is this twisting, as you'd expect, the flux lifts some of the moduli. So there's a naive set of moduli for this kind of complex, and then some of them get lifted by the flux. Um, right. Just say there's a caveat there that we're sort of ignoring the sources. We're saying that we're not 
going to perturb, we just have some fixed sources and we don't perturb the sources when we do the moduli calculation. So not only that, but you find something else, which is that as for the Calabi Yau case, in the Calabi Yau case, to find the moduli, you don't need to actually get a solution of the Calabi Yau. You can just use the uh, complex algebraic geometry or the complex geometry to calculate the moduli. And the same thing happens here. So you don't actually need to be at the full solution in order to understand what the moduli are. So let, let me say this in a slightly different way. So, so this, is, this is the space of all the uh, structures. And here's the solutions at the moment of the D term. So you really want to sit here. You can actually complexify the action of the diffeomorphism, the generalized diffeomorphisms. The imagine the, the ordinary ones would just move you along this mu equals zero case. That's the property of the moment map. The sort of imaginary direction takes you off here into some other orbit. And in fact, you don't have to be at this point. You could be at this point, and if you calculate, you can actually calculate the moduli just knowing that point. So um, that's good because you may not be able to find the full solution, but you may be able to find solutions that satisfy the evolutivity condition. And, assume, and so long as you are sure that there's some orbit that hits this moment map, then you can use that point to calculate the moduli. If we, just to go a little further, we could do the same thing in M theory. And in that case, it reduces, in fact, to just calculating some Duran or Debeau cohomology twisted by flux. So there it's, in a sense, even simpler. Okay, so the point is, I want to, I want to take away that by going to this larger structure group of the exceptional group, you end up solving problems where the intrinsic torsion vanishes. You're solving some, some integrable things. And there's a natural cohomology that you get out that counts the number of moduli. So in principle, this would be a way of, of looking at the um, landscape that includes other, other supersymmetric vacuum other than the ones that are, that are sort of collabing out with a bit of flux. To OK, let me just make a couple of asides. So um, one is you can use these same ideas for ADS solutions. So um, in terms of looking for new solutions, there's a whole field that's gone through looking at new solutions with different amounts of supersymmetry and dimensionality and using these, these generalized structures can be very useful. You can also analyze finite, the, 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 uh, these cohomologies that I talked about end up counting things like the number of chiral operators in the, in the dual field theory. So that's a very useful thing. This is something we did with Ed. It also, this picture that I drew here, this is characteristic of problems in mathematics that um, have some stability notion. So you, you, you want to know that there's solutions on here. Instead, you try and argue about the properties of things on this curve. And if you have some nice convexity or something, you can argue there has to be some point where it cuts, cuts here. So rather than actually finding the solution, you can argue for the existence of solutions. And that appears in emission Yang Mills equations, in um, formulations of Kähler Einstein equations, and so on. So, so that's an interesting connection. And it, can start telling you things like maybe giving you pictures for the existence of solutions, for example, in the case of G2. So that's just a couple of asides. So I was now going to quickly go on and talk a little bit about consistent truncations, but are there any questions there? Uh, I want to ask about these uh, generalized diffeomorphisms. Yeah. So, so the so do they do they form a group actually, or 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 how? They do form a group. They're just the symmetry group of the supergravity. So right, but but, but if you move, it's engaged transformation. Right, but aren't they supposed to be generated infinitesimally by by the you know by by the by the Dorfman bracket? Yeah, it's more like the adjoint action of the Dorfman bracket than the Dorfman bracket itself. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. So I shouldn't take too much longer, but. Um, I want to say something quickly about consistent truncations. So Emmanuel is going to talk more about this, but um, let me just say, first of all, what a consistent truncation is. So a consistent truncation is somewhere where you have a solution, a truncation of theory, and you know that every solution of the truncated theory is a solution of the full theory. So this is useful if you're doing dimensional reductions, because then you can write some effective theory in four or dimensions, say, and you know that there's a true, honest, um, supergravity solution for every solution you write down. So here's a, here's a stupid example. Suppose you've got two scalar fields. One of them has a mass. 
and there's a coupling. Now, if you turn, try and turn off the lambda field, that's inconsistent because um, you see that the phi field is a source for lambda. So I can't consistently turn off lambda. Now, if I was looking at things uh, uh, much below the mass scale of lambda, of course, I could have some effective theory where I just go down on the theory of phi, but that's a different story. That's, that's, a, that's an effective theory. However, if I turn off the phi field, um, phi doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, lambda doesn't, doesn't source phi, so I get a perfectly consistent theory. And there's actually a symmetry reason in this problem why that happens. The consistent theory is we, there's a Z2 symmetry here where you do nothing to lambda and you flip phi. And, and, and you're keeping the fields that are, that are invariant under that symmetry. So you can ask the same problem if you have a dimensional reduction. If you have some theory and you're going down to some, uh, say, 10 to a four dimensional theory, is there some finite number of glutz Klein modes you can keep so that this theory down here is always a solution of the one up here? And there's no need now for any scale separation. You just keep, the, the, these modes could be, could be quite massive, but the point is they don't source any of the other ones. In the ads CFT correspondent, this is an example of something where the modes you keep form some closed subsector of the field theory. So something like the modes that are in the, um, in the uh, conformal multiple, they include the stress energy tensor. Um, so there's a natural question is what kinds of theories can you get here? What theories on X arise as consistent truncations in string theory or supergravity? And there's a well-known way of doing that, which is a Schirk-Schwartz reduction, which is where you just choose the internal manifold to be a group, to just be a lead group, or perhaps some quotient by some discrete group. And you just keep the left invariant modes. So you use the symmetry. By keeping the left invariant modes, they're all singlets under the, under the left action. So, and singlets can't source charge things. So you know that it's gonna be, you know that it's gonna be uh, consistent. So, so, so for example, we just take the left invariant vector fields, they have some of the algebra, we just keep things, expand things in those left invariant vectors or the corresponding forms. And when you do that, you get some gauge theory, um, some gauged gravity downstairs, and you get a gauge group, which is set by this Lie group G. So in the flavor of what we've been doing, how do you extend that in the generalized case? Well, you take, um, this was a global basis of vector fields. So now we take a global basis of generalized vectors, I'll call them Ks, and under their BRAC, under their generalized E derivative, you have some structure constants. So in terms of the structures, this is like choosing an identity structure because we have a global frame. And these Xs are just the intrinsic torsion. This is what we call a Leibniz parallelization. And for each such thing, you get a consistent truncation. So you just expand the generalized metric in terms of these things. And again, by symmetry, you'll get some consistent truncation. In general, you get a gauge maximal supergravity. And this was a way of understanding some mysterious consistent truncations that people knew existed for a long time, but didn't really have a geometrical picture for, which were these reductions on spheres. So M theory on a four sphere or a seven sphere or type two B on a five sphere. It also gives a way of understanding poisson li u-duality. So that's some extension of u-duality when you've got some, um, some non-abelian group, something like non-abelian t-duality. Works at the level of supergravity. You don't know it works at the level of the full string theory. And, and in that case, this duality is really just two different parallelizations that, Leibniz parallelizations that give the same, give the same algebra. So what can this be useful for? Well, so for example, um, back in 2012, it was understood, it thought, people thought there was only one gauged SO8 supergravity in four dimensions, which was the one that came from the reduction on the seven, on the seven sphere. But these people showed that actually there's a family with a parameter. So you might immediately ask, can you realize any element in that family using, um, uh, using a consistent truncation? Do they all appear from supergravity? And, and using this language of Leibniz parallelizations, you can show no. So there's only one thing that appears. So we now have some, we're beginning, so this is classifying the landscape of um, maximally supersymmetric consistent truncations to four dimensions that the gauge in SO8. And it turns out that there is a class of, there's a big class that you might get, 
but actually only one of them appears from appears from uh, from M theory or string theory. And you can extend these ideas. You can think about um, more generally G structures with just some singlet intrinsic torsion and argue that in each case they give you a consistent truncation. And so that's a way of further classifying the landscape of theories. So I think Emmanuel will talk more about that maybe. But it's sort of, it's an interesting question. Not, these are not theories that are effective theories, but these consistent theories, there's also some rules about which ones you can get from a uh, string or M theory and which ones you can't. Okay, are there any questions on that? Okay. Could you comment about the case with less supersymmetry? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so what happens is that you could, in the maximally supersymmetric case, you take an identity structure. If you want less supersymmetry or even no supersymmetry, you take some uh, other G structure, some larger group. Um, but you still insist that it just has singlet intrinsic torsion. And if you do that, there's then a prescription for how you get a consistent truncation. So if you were doing less supersymmetry, you'd need to make sure you chose the G structure so that you still only had two invariant spinners or four or however many you were interested in. Did that help? Okay, thanks. Dan? Yes. In the spirit of the workshop, at least Good. half of it. So would you dare to say that the theories that you don't see coming from supergravity are in the swampland? Um, so we spent some time trying to think about whether we could get these by doing something like a um, uh, uh, doubled or extended field theory and letting things depend on additional coordinates. And again, it seemed like you couldn't. So some evidence that maybe it, maybe they are in the software. But I don't know quite how to, I mean, this is a strange thing to do from the point of view of lower dimensional theories because you're keeping some particular sector, but it's not distinguished by being the light sector. It's being distinguished by being some closed sector. Then I see also a question in the chat by Robert. Yeah. You want to have a look? Or I can also read it to you. Can the quantum effects? Um, yes, yeah, so I think what we're assuming here is that everything, we, we tend to use some supergravity upstairs and the quantum effects in that case are going to arise at higher order terms. So if we ignore the higher order curvature terms, then we're just always, and the supergravity is determined essentially. So um, from the point of view of the reduction, I don't think it's, I don't think it affects it. But let me, let me turn a little bit because I was gonna say something about going beyond supergravity. So in the spirit of the workshop, I can ask some very broad question, which I don't have any uh, insight on, but, you might ask, why are we seeing these generalized geometries? Why is it that it seems like these supergravities naturally can be formulated this way? So you might ask, is this some, is this some sort of natural or necessary way of doing the geometry when you want to extend the diffeomorphism symmetries? So Actually, there's a sort of very minimal set of ingredients that go into this. So if you like generalized geometry roughly depends on a couple of choices of vector spaces, these two things I've mentioned, and some, some sort of non-degenerate map between them. And once you have this structure, it can actually give you lots of things. So you then from that, well, this is the generalized tangent space. From the map, you can work out the GLD subgroup. And from that, you can get a generalized the derivative. So there's something so is, it, is there something in this generalized geometry so that sort of suggested that it's somehow intrinsic to string theory or supersymmetry or quantum gravity? I don't really want to, I have, no, I have no insight on that. From some point of view, it's coming from whatever symmetries the string field theory have. That's ultimately where it's coming from. 
So another way you might say this is how do you extend this to some remnant of that symmetry? So question is what happens if we try and put in higher string moments? So this takes me back to this, these ideas of double field theory and, and exceptional field theory. So the, these, are, these, these theories were first considered by thinking about string theory on a torus and keeping both winding and momentum. So effectively, then you get a double space, some for the winding, some for the momentum. And then there's two different things you can do. There's what's called a strong constraint, where effectively you take this double space and you just project back down to the original torus. And that just gives you generalized geometry. There's something else you can do, which is a weaker condition, which gives you something more like a consistent truncation, maybe, because there's no hierarchy in keeping. This is somehow sort of integrating out the oscillator modes in the string field theory. There's a paper by Sen that I'll use that this makes some sense. Um, and so you're again not keeping things by some hierarchy because the, the winding modes might be very heavy compared with the oscillator modes. So, but it, there's a sort of formal description of this theory using some n infinity algebras that was something that people have been doing recently. So, so, so maybe there's something, something here that you can start including some, some kind of stringy corrections in a particular way. But more generally, you might just say, well, let's just do it locally. Let, let, let's have a local, a local solution to the strong constraint. Uh, and that in general will give you some non-geometrical vacuum. So things that, are, um, that can be patched by T-duality. And that, that's a very interesting thing. So there's a way of describing another set of string vacua, which are essentially things patched by T-duality or U-duality. And then you might also wonder whether you can go to other geometries. So, uh, Dieter and collaborators have looked, and, and, and Volk Hassler and people have looked at how you might extend this to other manifolds, so to group manifolds, you have to modify some of the construction. Um, Mariana and collaborators have looked at how you might include the heterotic string and, and the fact that you can have um, gauge enhancement at self-dual radii, can you describe that somehow by extending the tangent space? So people have looked at various things like but let me mention something different, which is that you might think that generalized geometry is going to be a helpful way of looking at higher order corrections, these things that come at, at higher curvature terms. Um, because the higher curvature terms in the theory should be writable as Riemann terms. So they might look like, you know, for example, if you have type two, there'll be some corrections that look like Riemann to the fourth. So you might wonder if you can write the Riemann to the fourth terms using generalized geometry. And it would naturally package them together with terms that come from the H and the dilaton and so on. And more than that, it's interesting because we said that this, this connection is not unique. And so in fact, you can define a Riemann tensor in the ODD case, but it depends on this choice. And in fact, in the ED case, there doesn't seem to be any way to define a Riemann tensor. So that's gonna strongly restrict, although the Ricci tensor is all right. So that's gonna strongly restrict the terms you might write down here. So it's very suggestive that you ask, how can you construct new unambiguous invariants from this connection, which you could use as, as both order corrections? So if, if you want to do that, you're saying, can I write these corrections in a way that preserves this SODD structure and also the local symmetry? So I think people thought that that was going to be a very positive way of doing it, but it turns out it's hard. So it seems actually, if you do this to R squared in the bosonic theory or the heterotic theory, you can't write down these terms, the R corresponding R squared terms, without somehow modifying the, the construction of the generalized Lie derivative. Now, you can make some progress by doing something a bit weaker. So there are some weaker conditions that are sort of inspired by the generalized geometry, I think it might be fair to say, um, that can start trying to, trying to construct these things. But I think it's still a sort of open question if there's anything meaningful we can try and write down here using generalized geometry. Perhaps the loop corrections are more natural than the alpha primes. Um, I'm sort of conscious I should finish up. So let, let, let me say one more thing, which is that you might also wonder whether there are some interesting topological sectors you could work in where you might understand corrections that some class of corrections. So, so I'll go back to a, a, an older problem. So, so let's think about the case, if we have a complex structure, we can define, let's define it by this holomorphic three form, that's some SU3 structure. When you go to the generalized geometry, that corresponds to some generalized Calabiao, which is 
Now, just some general even for, uh, odd form. So it could have a three form in it, but it could also have a one form and a five form. That's some SU33 structure. Now, we know that the complex structure defines the topological B model. And furthermore, there's an argument that the, you can think of uh, in, the, in the classical theory, the B model, the, the target space theory, its action is actually related to something called the Hitchin functional, which is just built out of this structure. So it's just you take omega, wedge omega, and integrate over the manifold. But there's also a Hitchin functional for this object, which is really just the spinner pairing, right? You've got spinners, you can take spinner, spinner conjugate. And because of the weight, you can integrate that over the manifold as well. So there's an old paper by Peston and Whitten who did uh, quantized these two theories and did one loop calculations on them and then saw which one is the one that gives you the B model. And as you might expect, it's actually not this one, but it's this, this one that gives you the B model. And that's, that's because this is including somehow the B field degree of freedom of the string, which is what should appear in, this, in the string topological theory. But actually these structures give you other examples of these cases. So if you have some structure where there's some involutive subbundle, then you nearly always get a generalized Hitchin, some kind of Hitchin functional that extends these ones. And it's some Kähler potential, and you get it, it's actually just interpreted as the Kähler potential on the space of structures. So this is interesting because it may give us new examples of top possible topological theories. And they're ones where it's in some sense you're including the Ramon Ramon fields or you're looking at them in M theory or something. You can also do it in the heterotic theory. Um, so this, this is in a sense, there were people who looked at G2 functionals, and in some sense, these are some extensions of those by, by adding a flux. So that's another way you might get some information about higher order terms that are somehow constrained using the generalized geometry. Okay, so I should finish. I'm sorry, it's a long time for me to be talking. Um, let me just mention, I, I won't really say anything other than just to reiterate. So, so the basic idea I want to get across is that I think generalized geometry is a tool in this context for investigating the landscape. And I gave you some examples, which were these, you can calculate moduli of flux backgrounds, there's these consistent truncations where maybe you can begin to see what's, you can have ideas about what's in the landscape and what's not. Um, there's another thing I didn't mention, but or I mentioned in passing, which is you get lots of natural metrics on spaces to structures here. So this is like if you want to calculate um, distances, you can look at distances both in moduli spaces or more generally in, a, in actually a space, the analog of the space of metrics. It could be the space of these structures. Um, underneath generalized geometry just extends the conventional notions of geometry. There's this sort of question I don't have any insight on about whether it's somehow inherent to strings or quantum gravity, or it just happens to come up this way. And as I mentioned, it's got some interesting mathematics and particularly you can relate things to ADS CFT, which is slightly on the side. Um, and as I just discussed, there's some potential to go to beyond supergravity, but at least at first blush, generalized geometry is a tool in supergravity. So let me stop there and thank you for listening. Okay, very good then. Thank you very much for this very nice overview over generalized geometry. I propose that we still have time for questions or discussion. So are there comments or questions? Yes, I, yes, I have a question. Thanks for the talk, uh, Daniel. I have a question. So, uh, simplest examples of these generalized geometries are toroidal orbifolds. Uh, and one of the things about toroidal orbifolds is that typically we get extra massless modes and all that, and it's not often easy to figure out what is the moduli and all this of these theories. For geometric ones, we know they come from special points of Calabria and this and so forth. When you have supersymmetry, so we have a lot of handle. If you take examples which are uh, orbifolds, can, you, this, can these general geometries shed light and have people worked on those to try to understand, let's say their moduli space and things like that, which at special points become orbifolds? So let me make sure I understand, so you mean the non-geometric backgrounds or the 
overfills that are giving you non-geometrical non descriptions? Well, there are two things you could do. I think you yeah. can do what you call generalized geometry. So for example, your SU3 times SU3 structure, yep. you could take left and right, which act independently on left and right. And that's part of what you're calling generalized geometry. You can also do what, what you could call non-geometric one. I don't know, maybe you do call, I don't know how you distinguish them where you have subgroup of SO, SO12 or whatever that, you, I mean, they're mixing the left and the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, to one group, not, not mixing okay. left and right. Yeah, exactly. so, so at least a subset of it you certainly can discuss. And maybe you can do a more general one. Uh, have anybody started looking at these? Because one of the things about these general geometries is computability and yeah, perturbative corrections and all that, you want to make sure that we are on the solid ground. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, no, I think, I mean, things like extra states that are appearing, because it's all in supergravity, you're not going to see those things. And, like, the, I think what is, um, I mean... No, no, sorry, I mean, maybe I didn't make myself clear. I didn't oh, mean sorry. the extra states. I said that you should, you should, could you deduce by the marge, can you understand the moduli space? of these oh. state theories for which there will be an orbital point, which is not the regular Calabia, let's say, or some other geometry. That's not the usual stuff. Sorry, I think I understand. Presumably uh, your methods should be applicable to that, which is why- Yeah, absolutely. Asking. Sorry, no, I understand. Yeah, absolutely. No, I haven't tried doing that, but absolutely, I think we should be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, nobody has looked into those. No one's looked at that yet. So let me ask another related question. So suppose you're interested in Minkowski vacuum. So let's say very specifically, actually, suppose you're interested in just the kind of example you mentioned, n equal to two, let's say in four dimensions. Has any new examples arisen which we did not know about in these contexts? In other words, what has it taught us about this class? Um, I, don't, I don't know any new examples there. Where I do know new examples is in ADS. I see. So non, so non Minkowski, non. Uh, yeah. So in particular, as you know, there's there was an open problem about finding the backgrounds that are dual to all the n equal one deformations of n equal four. So we knew some of them, which were the beta deformations, but there's a larger class. And just recently, we have a way of understanding those backgrounds using generalized geometry. I see. Okay. And you can, for example, calculate the spectrum of Carl operators. I see. Do you, do you have any insights about, I mean, one of the motivations at least uh, we had in, back in the late 80s to understand these more general geometries is to get rid of moduli. And uh, for example, the cosi crystalline compactification where you rotate it in such a way that froze the moduli, the very specific moduli killed almost all moduli. And so it left very little degrees of freedom. Have similar things appeared in these contexts that you're dealing with, in the context of general geometry that, we, that sheds light on moduli stabilization or, or killing, killing moduli? So I, th I think the best I can say is this sort of picture of like, um, in the same way that you lift moduli by a superpotential that depends on some flux, this, those same kinds of pictures appear, but you can now think of lifting moduli not around a clavial, but some other background. I don't know if that, but that's very generic. I wouldn't, I don't have anything that's particular to what you say. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Perhaps I could uh, add concerning this question of the um, de description of moduli. So for, for instance, uh, people have studied this deformation of generalized complex structures. And of course there appear some uh, mixed types. So for instance, some mixture between symplectic and complex structure and uh, jumping pheno phenomena. And so this has been studied. And so there are some uh, results how to describe, for instance, the space of infinitesimal deformations in this larger uh, setting. So I think that some, something has been done. Of course, it's not so well developed as the classical Kodara Spencer theory, but there are some uh, results. So for instance, by Quartieri in, in his PhD thesis published in the Annals of Mathematics, there you, you will find some Okay, thanks. General results. Okay. Good, are there more questions? Can I add a remark about this? Perhaps uh, generalized complex geometry doesn't quite find new Minkowski uh, vacua because they don't exist. I mean, maybe, basically don't exist. I mean, they, there are some silly examples that you can find by t-dualizing known ones and you uh, 
uh, find some little manifolds, for example, but uh, uh, perhaps the, deep down there is some reason that uh, this problem reason doesn't find them. And that's um, otherwise, as uh, Danny was saying, for the S, um, uh, yeah, the, I mean, that, there the um, formalism is very uh, productive. I would venture to say that uh, most supersymmetric ADS vacua have been found uh, with this formalism. That maybe, maybe that's not true, I don't know. Okay, thank you, Alessandro, for the remark. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let us thank Dan again. And um, well, do the organizers want to say something more or do we uh, close the session now? You can close the session, yeah. Okay, in this case, we close the session. Again, thanks to the two speakers. And I guess we uh, start the same time tomorrow in the afternoon yes. in Europe or in the morning. United States. Yeah, uh, thank you, States. everyone. Okay, good. Thank you, everyone. The Gather Town is open uh, if people want to stay there. Yeah, otherwise, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thanks, Dan, for the nice talk. Yeah, no, it was nice, really. <laughs> Could I ask you a brief question, Dan? Please. Um, I was surprised you were venturing into quantum corrections. Um, any idea why the exceptional story should in any way survive? or work other than it might? Um, I so think you, you mentioned you might have to modify some things, but like, is there any tuition for why anything should survive? Well, I, I think the best argument <laughs> is not a good argument, but like there are some corrections that come, you can get by doing um, effectively just loops in the supergravity. So yeah. to low order, the, 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 what you get is the same form as, you know, you can effectively just integrate out supergravity fields. Now, if you just integrate supergravity fields, then you might hope that it keeps the same form. I think the moment you start integrating out any new degrees of freedom, then, so in the, in the type two case, maybe it seems to me that it'd be more likely you can do something with loop terms than with alpha prime terms. But you're right, in the M theory case, it's harder to make that distinction. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's not, I mean, in the ODD, it's, I, I don't also know what the right interpretation is, but obviously, I mean, there's very young papers, but some, there's some way in which you can do it in ODD plus N or whatever, but then I guess there's also in some sense in which you modify to ODD plus infinity, and then, well, uh, I don't know how to really interpret that, especially in the EDD case that there isn't really a sense in which you can do this, so. Yeah. Um, I was just curious, given that you said something about this, I thought maybe you had some very deep thoughts in this direction. No, so I, I would wanna do something where you don't modify the bracket, but you only describe certain terms. That's, that would be, the, that, that's the direction I'd wanna go. And I think in the in the uh, in the type two case, that can sort of would seem like the first loop correction should be like that. But I understand. I understand. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how you modify the bracket. That's some L infinite.